Hi, Rich. Hey, Jack. How you doing today? Rich, we've had a problem. What was that problem? This this past few months. You see, we, we do a show here at Red Letter Media called Best of the Worst. And, and we often abbreviate that to BOTW. But then they announced the new Zelda game, Breath of the Wild, which a lot of people abbreviate to BOTW. They, they should have just called it Best of the Worst. I mean, fuck it. Just stab us right in the dick. Damn Zelda. It's made life so hard. It, Mostly because I can't stop playing Zelda BOTW. So Zelda, Breath of the Wild, uh, is an action adventure game with deep themes of exploration where you play as Link, the a knight of Hyrule, and you have to rescue Princess Zelda from the evil clutches of Calamity Ganon. That sounds familiar. I think it's based off of another game. It's based off of another L game? Loosely. Zelda's kind of like Star Wars. Yeah? It's very limited. <laughs> it has, well... Knight and princess fight the Ganon monster. Rebels and Jedis fight the Empire. Z Zelda is very limited in setup, uh, though it's been executed in many different fashions. You're always Link. You always rescue Zelda. You're always fighting Ganon. But uh, sometimes you're on a boat. <laughs> There's always a gimmick. There's always a gimmick. Sometimes you got to train. Some sometimes you have a flute. Sometimes you can get really tiny. Sometimes you're flat. Ooh, yeah. <laughs> they've they've been taking the same formula mm -hmm. and then just adding some kind of stupid cheap gimmick to it uh -huh. for like the last 20 years? About, about, yeah. And this time around, well, you know, we finally have been a long time since we had a 3D Zelda. It's been uh -huh. five or six years. Mm -hmm. and this time, the gimmick is we don't have a gimmick. <laughs> We're going back to our roots. <laughs> yep. Which means that the Breath of the Wild has this theme that's heavily integrated into every single aspect of the game, which is exploration. The freedom of movement. Oh my god, it sounds like they're doing it right. <laughs> they are! <laughs> From the beginning of the game, you can go anywhere you want. You can climb anything. One of your very first little objectives is you have to go to this special place that erupts from the ground and turns into a giant tower. Well, you know, importantly, that tower, it lifts you up mm -hmm. from the ground and it lets you see the map. And you can see all of these places and it's it's not just like background skybox dressing. Mm -hmm. It's it's places you can go to. The game is telling you you can go there. Mm -hmm. That's it's it's almost it's almost mind-boggling the freedom that Nintendo gives you. Playing so many modern games, you forget. You forget about just freedom and doing what you want. So early in the game, you're on top of this tower. And uh, the, the man you're talking to points out something in the distance. He points out a little shrine and he says, Hey, you might want to go check out that shrine over there. It's, it's weird. You know, you know what he doesn't tell you? Hmm. How you have to get there. He doesn't say, you go through this road, which will turn, and but that'll be guarded by a wall that you need to get the key for. The key will be in the graveyard that's right next to it. Don't worry about it. You just go get the key. And then you come back to the door and then you open that door. And there's another <laughs> pass. And, and then you'll see a wall. The wall, the wall will have handholds so you can climb that one specific spot on the wall and then the shrine will be right there. There is a severe lack of tubes. <laughs> I think that's one, of, that's one of your favorite ways to describe kind of the, the on-rails modern uh, exploration game. This is one of the things I despised about specifically Firewatch. Mm -hmm. Is, uh, is, you're surrounded by this this wilderness. Here's the open wilderness, and there's like a, just a series of tubes you can go through. You can't go anywhere you want. Right. It is so fucking refreshing to play a game that isn't filled with invisible walls. Right. I, there's like a fence. What I need is right over the fence. I, I, the stupid door's not opening. I, there's a key I gotta get or something. I'm like, can't I just climb over the fence? <laughs> 
and in, in in Zelda Breath of the Wild, you could just climb over the fucking fence. Mm -hmm. And and they show you that right away. They give you an objective, and the the straightest line to that objective, you got to climb a mountain. Maybe maybe you could take the long way around, find a path or a, a more gradual incline, or you could just climb right over the fucking mountain. Yeah. God, I love that. But uh, that's like the important thing about this game is they do a ton of explaining the mechanics without having someone tell you what the mechanics are. There's a thing you gotta go to. How? Oh, oh, Mister, Mister, how am I gonna get there? Bye. <laughs> The, the biggest give to this game is go anywhere, wherever you want, whenever you want. It's, it's, it's refreshingly non-linear. One of the major ways that you get anywhere yeah. is just climbing. Just climbing. The, the climbing anything is, is really nice. It is, and, and Nintendo found the right way to gamify climbing. Because, you know, you can climb anything, but you do have a stamina meter. And when you run out of stamina, the, you know, it's, it reminds me a lot of uh, Shadow of the Colossus. Yeah. Kind of, they had a grip meter. So when you run out of stamina, you'll just stop climbing. It's not like the climbing meter, it's not like your stamina meter is an other invisible wall. Like, ah, there's no way you could ever be able to climb the mountain because your stamina will run out. Mm -hmm. No, no, there's a little bit more to it than that. Mm -hmm. Even though you have limited stamina, you can you can do things to mitigate that. You can you can drink some potions that refill your stamina when you're halfway up, and so you can get up there. Mm -hmm. Or you could level up your character a bit, and then you get a just a higher stamina bar sure. to get all the way up there. Or you find the, the climbing gear that lets you yeah. climb faster. So you can climb anywhere, but yeah. Nintendo gave you a proper hurdle. Because you, it's, if you just could climb anywhere, it would be meaningless. The stamina bar is the hurdle that mm -hmm. you need to overcome, and that's what gamifies it. They also threw in a dice roll when climbing, which is rain. Why? Why? It is... This game does so many things right. Yeah. And we barely even talked about the fucking game, but rain is one of the most baffling things I think they did more or less wrong. So when it rains, rocks are slipperier. And it makes climbing near impossible. Like, very difficult to near impossible. See, the rain's a bad decision. I think, I don't know, do they intend for you to, like change up what you were doing well i can't climb now i have to do something else for me whenever it rained and i was like i was climbing to get up to that that shrine or yeah. that that tower or just to see what was up there mm -hmm. and i just had to stop playing for like five or ten minutes till it stopped raining and it was it was <laughs> just irritating This is an open-ended game that that lets you do whatever you want. Like, you could literally, like, from the opening of this game, the second you get the paraglider, mm -hmm. go straight to the Hyrule Castle and try and fight Ganon. You would probably do a terrible job with it because you would have three hearts and you'd be armed with a tree branch. <laughs> <laughs> this is a game where there is literally... Only one true objective, defeat Ganon, and everything around it, the hours, the, the 60, 100 hours of gameplay is all just prep work for that one thing you have to do. And it is, <laughs> it is entirely optional. Everything is supplementary. The four divine beasts you have to, to free from Ganon's control, yeah. optional. Your, your side quest as an amnesiac knight to regain his memories, mm -hmm. optional. The the shrines you can find to build up your hearts and stamina meter, optional. Like, if you want, you could just get together a whole bunch of potions for your fight with Ganon and not worry about the shrines. The game lets you tackle it how you want to tackle it. You, 
when you're crawling around mountains and meandering through forests and galloping through deserts and hiking through snow, the vistas are great. <laughs> you will just come across hundreds of items to pick up and put in your pocket. There, there's mushrooms and there's crickets and you can kill boars and take their meat and berries and bananas and twigs and you, you fucking there's everything everything in this game and you just take it and you put it in your pockets yeah and even then even like in the raw form like the mushroom you find it doesn't do much for you no it gives you like a quarter of a heart you need you need to do something with that to make it better you need to cook it yeah and uh cooking things like you can get different effects from them like uh if you cook a, the iron mushroom with some steak you get a thing that'll fill your health and give you boosted defense mm -hmm. prep work is one of the one of the themes throughout the game is <laughs> prep work right because like, because you start i mean you start off the game you can get one shot by a boko goblin getting stronger is the the plot you you start this game as a tiny little baby and and a strong wind can kill you at the at the start. <laughs> the breath of the wilds can kill you. <laughs> Which also the, the the starting difficulty was was very refreshing from a Zelda game. So so you have these opportunities through foraging to better yourself, and a lot of that involves cooking, finding the different recipes. Oh, maybe if I mix together some fish with some vegetables and some milk, I could make a special dish. I personally had a big problem with this. I, I'm not much into these kind of survival games. Yeah. There, there are some that I've really enjoyed. Uh, even some survival games that involved cooking that I really enjoyed. But what I found myself doing is, you know, as I was exploring, I'd gather a ton of items, and then I knew I would want to go on to the next area. But before I could go on to the next area, I had to quick stop, spend 15, 20 minutes just cooking up random shit, and it always felt tedious. Here's the funny thing. Usually, I usually, 95% mm -hmm. of the time, I can't stand crafting in games. Yeah. It, it feels like a... Un, un, unnecessary busy work that takes me away from things I would rather be doing in the game. Yes. Uh, here, it doesn't bother me that much. I think that's because it's actually thematically really appropriate in this game. It's maybe a silly reason to like it now, <laughs> it, but I didn't mind. You're camping. You're camping all game. And it, so it does make sense. You forge all these different stuff. You have to cook them. But the process of cooking, and, you know, maybe a lot of it was just the user interface. Going through that stupid food menu and, oh, I got to pick. Where was that thing again? Oh, it's over here. Then plunking uh, down everything. If you've been gathering a lot of stuff, there's just a lot to go through. And that, that might be an issue. I, I wanted to fight, and I wanted to crawl on mountains. Every time I had to stop and cook food... It, it made me it made me bored. I I was kind of digging the whole survival thing. That's fair. That's fair. Early on in the game, I was actually actively avoiding battles. I was trying to stay alive as long as I could. Yeah. So we, so we have a, we have a game where you can you can go anywhere. Yeah. Uh, climb anything. Mm -hmm. It's an open world. Yeah. You just run around picking fruit. Why why is this exciting? Why is this exciting, Jack? So far, yeah. If anyone doesn't know anything about Zelda, so far this does not sound like a very exciting. No, game. it doesn't. This sounds terrible. What what what's what's the what's the draw? What do I get out of this, Jack? The the unequal joy of discovery. What? Is what you get out of this. So we, we have all of our tools. Yeah. We have all of our ingredients. Yep. And the, the payoff of this game is some epic exploration. 
before this game came out, and I was yeah. like, I was watching like some of the E3 footage where they're walking around. Yeah, they're making. Oh, they're making. He's making a campfire. Uh, there's a lot of space. Oh god, this is gonna be just a large, boring, empty world, isn't it? I was terrified about that. Mm -hmm. After playing it, I'm I'm shocked. Uh, for one, the world is it's fucking huge. Yeah, the world is comically large. Like the Wind Waker, that was a large world, but a lot of it was illusion. Not a lot of ocean. A lot of ocean. Mm -hmm. This is a legitimately large world, and it's shockingly dense. Yes. You're always finding something interesting and unique and new. And that's the main point. Interesting, unique, and new. We've played a lot of games with big worlds, with a lot of, thing, a lot of new things to discover. But a lot of times you'll find very cookie cutter areas. Yeah. It's your Ubisoft game, your Mad Max, your Far Cry. The, it's an, oh, it's an open world, do whatever you want. And there's all of these different areas, but those areas have the exact same fucking things in them. Yep. Uh, here's the bandit camp, here's the, the Revelation Tower, and there's the, the 10 things you have to destroy. What, what they did is, you know, they hit Apple C. <laughs> they take, you know, this asset, they drag it over here, maybe tilt it slightly. Apple V. <laughs> Little copy paste joke right there. But in Zelda, new things. They have things that appear in one side of the map that you will never see again. The large skeleton that's just sitting in the middle of a field, and at night it comes to life. <laughs> The island that you need to use a leaf on a sailboat to go to that makes you take off all your clothes and get rid of all your weapons and survive. The, if, if you climb the right mountain, you'll run into a fucking dragon that you have to fight. <laughs> <laughs> and even, even, even areas that are more mundane, you might find something useful there, like... Mm. Uh, there's this one area I got mar marked on my map, and that's just because I can find a lot of uh, heavy durians and, like, bananas there. And those are all very good for, like, cooking recipes. Mm -hmm. Ooh, this area, that's a lot of useful things here. <laughs> you might climb a tree and not find anything really good, but there's, like, a rock on top of the tree. <laughs> so then you lift up the rock, and it's one of those Koruk seeds. <laughs> now, they, they, we, talk, I talk, we talk about, like, the variety, and that, that yeah. that's what makes the game, just finding new things, and you never really know what you're going to find. Right. Because you do find unique things every now and then. It's not it's not immune to your Ubisoft repetition. Like the Koroks. Sure. You see the Under the Rock puzzle a lot. The, the, the shoot the balloons puzzle a lot. The put the apple in the basket puzzle. And and the one that irritates me, because you can, you can actually just see them from a distance. You see them all over. The towers. Every area's got the tower you climb, and that feels like a repetition. So, your your map starts off blank. Yeah. And in order to fill in your map, you need to climb the tower that's in each region. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm going to give the tower a pass as far as repetition because what it gives you is small, obtainable goals. It's progress. The, the wonderful thing about Nintendo, uh, spe you know, specifically about the people that designed The Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild, is strong art direction. If there is something that is beneficial for you in Breath of the Wild, chances are it is giant and glowing. The, the towers. If you plunk a new player down in Breath of the Wild, don't tell them anything about the game, they will immediately gravitate towards that giant glowing tower. And when you go to the tower, it fills in your map. It's very strong art direction. The giant flying bird in the Rito area, the, the volcano, the, the mountain with Aurora Borealis on top even has a little treat up there. Big, bold art direction that 
that makes you want to go places. The bird, the Aurora Borealis, and Death Mountain are all like unique things. The towers kind of take me out of it because they are all the same. But yeah, I, I, like I said, the my only defense of the towers is its little benchmarks. Let's just say you don't know what to do next. You have an objective sure. that you yeah. know you can accomplish something. Doesn't you... break the game for me. <laughs> I'd, have, I'd have rather have revealed the map through my actual exploration. You're talking uh, like Fog of War stuff, where yeah. if you go into an area, it reveals all the stuff you can see. A little bit of me prefers the towers, only because it is very scary going into that new area and not having the map. I know. It's great. I know. It's great. Well, then you get the map. Huh? You get the map, and that's gone. Well, but so like, but it's appropriately scary beforehand, and that makes me want to get the map. <laughs> Okay. That is the, that is the game guiding me to what I should do naturally without telling me I have to do it. There's just so much. I we discovered something last night. We were talking about how much of the game we played. Mm -hmm. And I I I finished the game. I, I finished the story. Not all the side quests because there's a million right. of them. But, but I, I finished the main story, and I was thinking to myself, I bet I got a good 30, 40 hours out of this. And I check the little hour reader on the Switch, and I have 65 hours yeah. into the game. Yeah. That's how immersive it is. Right. You do not feel it. But I, I have all of the map revealed. I finished the main story. I found all my memories. I got all the divine beasts conquered. Then we wanna we were curious as to how many hours you had into it. Be I thought I had around sixty-five. Sure, but but like you don't have all of the map revealed. No. You've only done one divine beast. So how many how many hours are you into the game? 125. I'm sorry, what? 125. But we, we see we played the game differently. Mm -hmm. You didn't you didn't mosey as much as I have. I've I've been like exploring the nooks and the crannies and yeah. what's this side quest? Let me do this side quest. <laughs> This guy wants some uh, some crickets. I better go find some crickets. This guy needs some crickets. <laughs> no, and you know, the, the most amazing thing is you have so many more hours than me, but I am sure there is stuff that I've seen that you haven't. Yeah. And also, I've done more of the story, and I know there's stuff you've seen that I <laughs> haven't. Right? Right, right. There is so much to do in the game. And that's nothing but a compliment. It, it it just, I don't know. It reminds me of like being a kid and sharing with your friends the things you would discover in games in the days before the internet. Yep, yep. That's that's Zelda Breath of the Wild. Like, what did you find? That's different <laughs> from what I found. Well, I found this over here. Right. We were playing the other day, and you told me, did you know you could ride a bear? <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, what? <laughs> what? So it, it, it invites that conversation that makes gaming such a unique medium mm -hmm. you watch a movie there, there's not going to be much that another person missed while watching a movie unless they weren't paying attention but because games are interactive we can each have our own experience playing the same game <laughs> So, so then we get to swinging a sword around. There, there are so many amazing encounters in the game. Uh, but why don't we just talk about, like, the standard combat? Because, you know, there is action in this game. There is fighting. You are the knight of Hyrule, the high knight of Hyrule. Yeah. And you know how to use a fucking sword or a stick or whatever you got with you at the time. Well, you, you're, you're going to have to know how to use a stick because your sword's going to break. But a basic combat is, you know, if it's just you versus one enemy, it's just swinging your sword. There's, uh, there's, some, do there's some special dodges and some special parries. You, you can, if you dodge at just the right time, you get a super slow-mo attack. 
Uh, if you parry at the right time, it actually reflects their attack back at them. These are fairly standard things. Fairly standard. You also have a bow and arrow. The most important tool in your combat arsenal, though, especially early game, is your ability to turn around <laughs> and run the fuck away. Well, yeah, early on, early on, <laughs> yeah. you turn around and run away because, like, the blue goblin can one-shot you. He can actually one-shot you at the start of the game. Uh -huh. Then, once you get to the later game, you turn around and run away because you have an arsenal of very good weapons that you don't want to waste on a lowly skeleton <laughs> because your swords constantly break. So, like, overall, I really liked fighting. I, you know, I'm an action guy. I'm an action game guy. Fighting could be really satisfying. The downside to it is every weapon you used lasted two, maybe three enemies before shattering. There, there's that weapons have a uh, a durability. They the, the swords all have numbers. <laughs> They don't have enough numbers. Like, I don't know if that plus, if that 36 level sword, mm -hmm. it means it has a strong attack or is it just more durable? I have no indication of, of the relative durability to attack. Nothing there. Um, also, I would love a health bar. I would love to know if my sword is like halfway ready to break mm -hmm. or if it's mostly full. So, some more information to work with would have been fantastic. For me, the the weapon breaking in general, every time a, every time a weapon broke, it was frustrating. It, it, it meant that I, I never felt comfortable fighting. Mm -hmm. You know, cl classic Zelda, especially for me, like, you know, stuff like Ocarina of Time, Wind Waker. It's all about mastery through repetition. And, and the combat in both Ocarina and Wind Waker is fairly simplistic. But you can get into a groove. Which you, your shield, your sword. You can get into a fighting groove and feel really powerful. Here, you never really felt powerful. That's the point. Yeah, maybe. That's, that's the point. Um... I think we can both agree. I'll agree with you on one thing. Mm -hmm. All of the weapons in the game could stand to be at least 25% more durable. <laughs> I would go with 50% more durable. <laughs> sure. Sure. They are trying to force you to switch it up. Uh, when you see a group of enemies in Wind Waker, yeah. you run in there and fight the enemies. It's great. It can be fun. But the combat in Zelda games, every 3D Zelda games combat has been pretty boring, pretty repetitive, and pretty boring. Here are a list of tactics I have engaged in, either because I didn't have a great weapon on me, mm -hmm. or my weapon was about to break. Okay. I have strategically used bombs to blow up groups of enemies. Mm -hmm. I might not have bothered in a past Zelda. I have... Uh, shot uh, exploding barrels to destroy groups of enemies. Mm -hmm. I I have set the ground on fire so that would start a brush fire that would engulf my enemies in flames. <laughs> I have used my magnet power to take a giant metal crate, levitate it over an enemy's head, and drop it on them. Mm -hmm. I, I have tried to use electric chews, the little glowy things, to electrocute other goblins that were in the vicinity of it. I I have used powers that I probably wouldn't have bothered when I could just sort it up. Hmm. Caused me to think about the battle. Sure. I have sure. I have snuck around camps with mm -hmm. my bow and arrow, picking things off before alerting everybody that I was there. Mm -hmm. These aren't revolutionary gameplay mechanics, but it's not the kind of thing you normally do in a Zelda game. And maybe that's part of it for me, is is I, I just have this idea of what Zelda combat should be. And because it's so different, it's unsettling for me. But like I said, the knowing that 
the weapons weren't very durable meant that finding a new weapon was never an oh yeah moment. If And if you did find a really killer weapon, you almost didn't want to use it because you knew it would break. Not, not so. <laughs> not so, Jack. I That's how I felt. This only works in the exploration's favor. If you had that one powerful weapon that you never lost, yeah. you wouldn't be happy to find interesting and new weapons in the wild. You might pick them up once, eh, I like the weapon I've been using better. Mm. Uh, for another thing, they respawn. Every, sure. every, every so often in the game, there is a blood moon. Yeah. Uh, the, the moon is red and this really creepy backward music starts playing. And at, like at midnight, all of the monsters you have killed come back to life. Mm -hmm. But everything in the overworld is restored. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the nice things this game has with, with, with its map, mm -hmm. you can put pins anywhere. Yes. You, can put, you can put little stamps down, and they have like a number of different icons. And like if I found a, a, like a really nice sword, like uh, I found a, we were playing the other night, I found a, just a giant fucking flame sword. I'm like, oh, sweet. And I instantly mm -hmm. opened up my map, I found my sword stamp. Right where I was standing, I put down the sword stamp. And so the next Blood Moon, I can go back there, I can get that sword again. And, you know, of course, like I said, for, for me, foraging wasn't that big a deal. <laughs> and and so, like, I I never cared about that part. And, and it, having to go back during the next Blood Moon would be tedious to me. One of the actually the neatest things about combat, this is one of the few games where you can do in game the thing that they showed in their teaser trailer. You take a bow and arrow mm -hmm. and you shoot it at a robot that is running amok in the wilderness because this is a civilization that used to have advanced technology. Right, right. But they've kind of lost that advanced technology and they have gone back to like bows and arrows mm -hmm. and spears. Like a more tribal But the robots society. from the previous advanced society are still kind of running around doing their own thing. This sounds familiar. It's, it's actually, like, it's shockingly similar to Horizon Zero Dawn. And here's the fun part, is technically Horizon Zero Dawn came out a week before Zelda, so we can say it's ripping it off. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but your Hunter from the Future came out 30 years ago. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> because it's because it's gonna come up. I, yeah. I bitched about uh, aiming, with aiming the with the thumbstick, aiming with some thumbstick, yeah. and a bow and arrow. Why why aren't you complaining about that with Zelda? Zelda has a very similar situation where you're you're shooting at little tiny moving targets with a with a controller. Mm -hmm. There is a lock on. There is a lock on, mm -hmm. which alleviates a lot of the controller's aiming problems. Absolutely. More importantly, uh, even the pro controller mm -hmm. has motion functionality use, use the thumbstick to to move you near the area then kind of get yeah that yeah fine, then you find mode yeah motion the motion controls make it serviceable and and i i turned off motion controls i didn't much care for them but i'm i'm 
uh, fine aiming with a thumbstick. But yeah, I, I think it's good that you point that out because you know someone's typed that in the comments. They're already bitching already. I'm biased against uh, Sony. Rich, you're just a Nintendo fanboy. That's the problem. <laughs> Especially the entire Zelda series. How how many times have you talked highly about all the entire Zelda series? Skyward Sword. Or Skyward Sword. There's, there's actually a, a Game Station episode Bing. of Skyward Sword. Is there? Are oh, you putting a link to that old fucking thing up there? Well, put, the, put the Vanquish link up. At least link to the good game. Jesus Christ. Did you do a Vanquish? I did Vanquish. Oh. They like us to space it out a little bit. <laughs> so hold on for a second. Just give give it a moment. You can't do one after the other with the links? They like it if you give it a little space between. Yeah. So, vanquish. Oh, thank you, thank you. Just for you, Rich. I don't know if we've specifically mentioned how awesome the Lionel fights are. <laughs> so, some of the bigger enemies in the open world, oh, it's satisfying. Yeah. You, 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 yeah. you got potions, a lot of rolling, you're, you're dodging, slow-mo moves, arrows, bombs. It feels fantastic. I have sense of butt. But. I was right. The boss fights, the the story boss fights. There are four main bosses in the Divine Beasts, and of course, spoiler alert: at the end of the game, you have to fight Ganon. Every one of those boss fights was a significant letdown for me. I want to say I beat them all on my first try. Several of them without losing a heart mm. it was standard zelda wait for the pattern shoot the thing hit them when they're down yeah yeah what my problem is is any of those boss fights aren't as interesting intense or satisfying as a lionel fight i will i will <laughs> agree to that probably because this is a very open game, and there's a, a structure to those fights. Mm -hmm. Like, his phase one of the battle, and then his phase two, he's going to start to... The room's going to flood, and something a little bit different is going to happen with the pattern. And right. it, it, it feels like a, a find-the-pattern thing rather than a, just a flu, a good just a good old fluid brawl. Right? And, you know, part of that might be because... You could do the Divine Beasts really early in the game before you've leveled up anything, before you get the good weapons, and so maybe they just want to make sure that even if you get there early in the game, you can handle that. But even Ganon. I, I, I have a theory mm -hmm. that uh, they started developing this game more in like the vein of like the past 3D Zeldas, like the Skyward Sword and Wind Waker, where there was going to be your, your standard, here's the dungeon, here's the item you get in the dungeon, because like the kind of items you would find in a dungeon, like here's the, the, the bombs, and here's the, the ice power you get that lets you access these areas. All of those powers are in the game, That those kind of things. Like yeah, the yeah. magnet power, but you just get them all at once. It's really strange. And I... I wonder if like those powers and like the boss fights aren't aren't remnants from a much <laughs> older build of this game that was a lot more standard Zelda. That would make a lot of sense. Yeah, you, you get a magnet power, you get a freeze time power, you get an ice power, and uh, and you get bombs. They feel like things that an entire dungeon would be built around this one power, but nope. It's actually, it's funny that you say that, like, so you get all of these powers. I found myself mostly only using them in the shrines. Mm -hmm. What and, are the shrines? Well, I'm the, hey, that was a segue right that was, there. That was a great segue. I felt pretty good about it.
so every once in a while in, in Breath of the Wild, you'll come across this tiny little shrine. And what it is, is a micro dungeon. If you think back to old Zelda games, one dungeon would have probably, what, 15, 20 little areas with a puzzle in it. So instead of one big dungeon with 15 puzzles, they took all those 15 puzzles and spread them out and put them in different shrines. And every shrine is just like one little puzzle. So, so mi micro dungeons? Micro dungeons. This is like the hipster, the hipster Zelda. There are craft dungeons. Ooh. We only have craft dungeons. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry. Uh, the correct term is artisanal dungeons. <laughs> uh, these were imported from Japan. <laughs> But it's, it's actually a really, really neat way to handle the puzzle element to Zelda. Because that's always been Zelda. A little bit of combat, a little bit of puzzles. Yeah, yeah. And in past Zelda games, you would be kind of at a choke point when you got to a dungeon. You had to get through the dungeon in order to progress in the game. And sometimes that would that would force a player to do something that they wouldn't want to do. Like, oh, I don't really fucking feel like a dungeon at the moment. <laughs> So what they've done by spreading out all these dungeons throughout the land, these mini dungeons, is they've opened up more opportunity for player choice. You get to determine the pace. If you love all of the puzzles, boom, 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 do them all. Go to the next one, go to the next one, go to the next one, do all the shrines. If you're not really into puzzles, you don't have to do any of them. <laughs> you, don't, you don't like this one puzzle? Well, you're stuck here in the story until you get it right. Not in Breath of the Wild. <laughs> You get to choose. If, if a puzzle's too difficult for you, leave. Come back later. Don't ever come back. Don't do it in the first place. They are, they are really ugly. Can I, can I criticize that? You absolutely it's, can. It's absolutely superficial, and it's absolutely true. It's... Yes. These, these, <laughs> these stupid-looking, like, blue walls, and everything is at a right angle. Why is everything at a sharp right angle? It looks so it's like, fake. It's like brown and blue and orange. It's this really drab color palette. And it, every, yeah, everything feels the same. Every shrine looks like the last shrine and it's all ugly. Something I really did like though, is the look of the ancient monks <laughs> that were like sitting waiting for you to pass their trial <laughs> is just these, these husks of old monks and they're all skeleton and skin and bones and I, I thought they looked really cool. They looked out of place, though, in, like, the angular blue science fiction <laughs> setting. Point to Rich. And just the, the blockiness of it made, it made it feel like a game from, like, 1995. <laughs> <laughs> Nintendo with... Zelda Breath of the Wild has given us the opportunity to truly play the game however we want, in whatever order we want, go wherever you want to go. It's freedom. It's freedom. It is. Games are so preoccupied. Uh, there's this obsession with narrative in, in games. It's a narrative structure. We're telling a story. Now you're making a game. <laughs> <laughs> the game can have a good story, but focus on the game mm -hmm. and there's no there's no linear story here that is forcing the game to be linear because your gameplay has to follow through with the events of the story you don't right, have right. you don't have to worry about your best friend sam dying tragically after he falls off the ship in the second act because you don't even have to go to the fucking ship and there is no second act <laughs> right <laughs> Very, very smartly. What what story there is mm -hmm. is told through flashbacks because your 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 link this time around has amnesia, mm -hmm. and so you just get little, like little snippets of things that happened in the past, and because they're flashbacks, they can come in any fucking order, mm -hmm. and that was genius. The downside to something like that is when you do have a really finely structured story, 
you can tailor your music to hit those story points. <laughs> and one of the weakest aspects of this game is the music. And I know like you don't really care about this yeah. as much as I do, but the music is so weak. It, it feels like temporary music, like placeholder music before, ah, we'll write a big score to this later. The, the flip side of the openness is they don't know what you're supposed to be feeling. <laughs> in, a, in another game, once you work, walk into the area with all of the ruins after you have the stunning revelation that your parents were really cyborg robots from the future, <laughs> they don't know to play sad music because they don't have that structure. <laughs> right, right. And so we, we end up with this minimalistic, half-assed feeling score. M most of it is this like two-finger plinky piano thing. Everywhere you went, the music felt half done. Given, given, given the flip side though, I, I, if, if I could, if I could take the way this is, it's really, it's a really good open game mm -hmm. with bad music. Or, or you have Skyward Sword, which was had the, like the best orchestral Zelda remixes that have ever been, mm -hmm. but it's boring as fuck. We have the better end of the deal. <laughs> I guess. You know what? I bet you can purchase the Skyward Sword soundtrack. <laughs> Just the headphones while you're playing this game? That sounds like a great idea. I fixed it, Rich. <laughs>
there's people that you just see walking around, like hiking from one area to another. They're like traveling peddlers. Some are just people who are out doing their own foraging. And you're you're constantly running across people, and it's it's not a big deal. It it doesn't do much gameplay wise. Mm -hmm. But it makes it feel like a lived-in world. Yep. I kind of like that. The, the the Zora village, the Goron village. There's the... like seven or eight towns. It feels like a real world. One of them, one of them, I don't even think has anything storyline attached to it. It's just a fishing village that's on one <laughs> end. Isn't that great? Yeah. <laughs> So it's, uh, Breath of the Wild is available on the Wii U and the Switch. We both were lucky enough to get a Switch, so we've been playing it on the new console. Yeah. There's some technical issues that I've been having. And I am not a frame rate junkie. I am not one of those people that say, hey, if it ain't running at 60 frames a second, I ain't playing it. I'm not that guy. But it chugs. You get into bigger uh, battles with larger beasts. You got a lot of arrows going around. You got a lot of effects going around. You are dropping frames all the time, and it turns into a slide show. I've seen issues that not that frequently. I, I, it'll every now and then it'll chug for a few seconds, but then it'll be back to more or less normal. It, it never got to the point where the, I would say the game were unplayable. It, it came close enough, often enough, where it bothered me. Uh, another big technical problem is draw distance. Uh, draw distance is... Uh, the point at which the uh, computer tells the camera that an object must appear. The draw distance was fairly short. There were, there were uh, for the details, like the mountains. Yeah, you see those in the distance. Of course. But you'll see, like there'll be like a person you're looking for, someone you have to talk to. And I know they were over there, but I don't see them over there. Where do they go? And you look around. No. You just didn't get close enough. Because they're well within what would be visual range before they pop in. Yeah. Sometimes. And that's just a hardware limitation. The, the worst case of that is when you accidentally run into a group of enemies and they've already spotted you and are heading your direction, but you can't see them yet. There's something else. It's not a technical flaw, but oh. it's a constant annoyance. Okay. Uh, it's the A B switch. The the damned A backwards A B. The first thing you know you you know tell you to hit the A button and you know you know what the alphabet is like. Mm -hmm. You're used to A coming before B. Yeah. A is now on the right. Which all right. It's, Nintendo. I think they've always done it's that. It's always been that way for Nintendo. And it's stupid. Just fix it. They have not evolved with how modern controllers work. The confirm button is the bottom of the four buttons, always. On Nintendo, the confirm button is the rightmost of the four buttons. Always and has been. I am constantly going to make my horse gallop. So, of course, I hit the bottom button, the positive button, the giddy up button, and you jump off the horse. It's constantly coming up, though. Oh, you know what? I want to make a quick uh, meal. I'm going to cook. So, oh, yep, I want to grab that item, and now I've left the menu. <laughs> and you, you, almost, you kind of get used to it, but never quite really, because our entire fucking lives, it's been the other way around. Right. <laughs> where's, where's the thing? I, like, despite, despite our whatever like we've we've brought up negatives this you know like rain or irritation you have irritation with weapons breaking right little things that irritate us things it does right uh, overwhelming recommendation I, I absolutely fucking love the game it's beautiful this mm -hmm. game is beautiful i could say i recommend it i'm assuming you can recommend it and any of the problems i have with it 
are immediately overshadowed by the positives. Uh, exploration, the ability to walk around and go anywhere you want is worth the game alone. Yeah. Then Nintendo decided to put stuff to do in it. <laughs> it's a beautiful game, a lot of fun, some mild nitpicks. How, however you slice it, ultra strong recommendation for the game. It's fantastic. Best game of the game of the year. It's re yes, it's really good. It's really very good. <laughs> so here's here's the last important thing I want to talk about. Mm -hmm. the, the Zelda series, the entire series, has a, a well thought out, elegant, and simple to follow continuity. So the important question is, where does Breath of the Wild fall on the Zelda timeline?